welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 150 of the American Muslim Experience, and I am joined, as always, by the show's co-host, Omar Ansari. Hey, Salaam Parvez, Salaam listeners, good to be back. It's been a couple of weeks at hey, least, so at least. Uh, glad to be back here recording. Yeah, well, in fact, so long that I have to do a little bit of an apology to the listeners uh, because it has been a while. Um, we were really good in Ramadan. I think we, we, we clocked like three episodes, including that amazing interview with Dr. Sube, uh, which yeah. is phenomenal, and we got a lot of great feedback on that. Um, uh, but uh, it, yeah, it has been a while. I think we took a little mini uh, Eid Either yeah. Adha post Ramadan break. You know, you know how like after Eid, you you like kind of let yourself go with food and all. <laughs> I guess we kind of let ourselves go with the, the podcasting too. We did, or to put it differently, we were just kind of saving it for the right guest. Mm. And and I think uh, I couldn't think of a better guest for our 150th episode because this is a returning guest. Not only a returning guest, but this was actually the second podcast we ever recorded. So I'm dating us back 10 years. So our guest today has not rejoined the show since 10 years. Um, um, But uh, anyway, we'll get into some of that. But uh, uh, if you could do the honors and introduce our wonderful guest. Yeah, we're definitely delighted to have Zafra Bilou here. Um, Somebody I've known probably for 20 years, just being in the Bay Area community. But um, let me introduce our esteemed guest. She would have been only 10 years old, so you couldn't have known her for 20 (laughs) years. Sorry, we, that's a uh, joke that, that we were doing off, that's uh, off right. mic. Yeah. Zahra Bellu serves as the executive director of the Council on American Islamic Relations, San Francisco Bay Area CARE SFBA office, uh, which is the oldest CARE chapter office. Since joining in 2009, Zahra has led the organization through a period of six-fold growth. Today, she manages one of the largest CARE offices in the country with a team of civil rights and social d- justice advocates dedicated to the empowerment of American Muslims through legal services services, legislative, advocacy, and community organizing. Under Zahra's leadership, CARE SFBA has filed lawsuits against the U.S. Department of Justice, Abercrombie and and Fitch, and Southwest Airlines, representing American Muslims facing discriminatory discriminatory treatment. CARE SFBA has also significantly expanded its capabilities to provide Know Your Rights sessions on a nearly weekly basis to mosques and community members in the San Francisco Bay Area, while also providing direct legal representation to Bay Area residents facing numerous civil rights violations, including FBI interviews, employment discrimination, airport harassment, school bullying, and hate crimes. Zahra's advocacy has included media appearances in local and national media, including MSNBC, NPR, SF Chronicle, and even Fox News. Among her awards, she's received the 2017 Human Rights Award from the Society of American Law Teachers and the 2018 Community Builder Award from People Acting in Community Together, also known as PACT. She was listed by the San Jose Mercury News as a woman to watch in March 2017 for Women's History Month, as well as by the Chronicle of Philanthropy in their 2018 January cover story on Millennials Who Lead. She's currently a fellow with Levi Strauss, Foundation Pioneers in Justice, a senior fellow with the American Leadership Forum Silicon Valley Chapter, and an alumna of Rockwood's Fellowship for a New California. Leadership's Leader Springs Executive Dir- Director's Fellowship and the USC's American Muslim Civil Leadership Institute. Zahra, Zahra earned her undergrad degrees from the Cal State University, Long Beach, and her JD Juris Doctorate from the University of California at Hastings. She is licensed to practice law in California. Welcome. Thank you for having me. I need to update the bio. I'm going to turn that over to ChatGPT in a couple of days. <laughs> right, because I was just about to say, because I think your um, uh, alma mater, in fact, your law school alma mater changed names. Yes, we're yeah. now UC Law San Francisco. Yes. But the thing that gets me about that bio is actually the thing that we have to cut out is Levi Strauss Foundation, oh. which uh, a couple of years ago was like, oh, we don't like what you said in support of Palestine. You can't be a fellow anymore. Mm. And so not maybe not necessarily where you want to start it, but still one of my favorite stories to tell because they came to they came to me and they said, we know we promised you an additional one hundred thousand dollars for care. Wow. And because of the things that you said, we're not going to give it to you. Yeah. The reason I like telling this story is because there were 10 other women and w- women of color in the program. And all 10 of them said if you take Zahra and cares one hundred thousand dollars, you can also take ours. Like, so this group of women was willing to walk away from a collective total of over one million dollars. And Levi Strauss was like, "Oh, no, 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 no!" Because we were like, "We're going to collapse your program." Like, right. what? And 
So Levi Strauss said you can have the 100,000. Actually, in fact, we'll give each of you 150,000 for your organizations. But we're also going to close the program because you <laughs> were all this. way more than we signed up for. Um, right. So I, I need to update wow. that on the bio. That's really interesting. Um, well, I definitely want to talk about uh, companies and brands yeah. and uh, some of your thoughts on BDS and the different levels of BDS. Some of this we've been talking off mic, but I definitely want to double click into that, uh, especially being in Silicon Valley where, you know, tech companies are uh, everywhere. Um, some, we'll save that for, for a yeah, bit. Right. Uh, I, I guess to, to, to kind of begin, I mean, well, to situate us, uh, we are sitting in your lovely new offices here in Santa Clara. Um, I'm having uh, flashbacks to when Omer and I were in Chicago over the summer and we were sitting in there in CARE's mm -hmm. lovely offices with Adam at the Rehab um, and team. Zucky joined us for that episode. Um, uh, but uh, I, I guess uh, I, I wanted to kind of pick up on Obviously, we've talked a lot. I remember about your background and your, you know, your roots and where you came from and what kind of attracted you to the work that Kara does. So we don't really need to necessarily rehash that, but I would love to for, to hear from you and for listeners who maybe may have not have heard that original episode to just maybe give us kind of a high level, like okay, you know, what you've experienced during your tenure at at, at Care and what that's been like and how long it's been. And just just for listeners uh, who may have not gone back and listened to every single episode in the in the in the in the in the catalog, uh, Zara was guest number two back in October 2013, well before my time uh, joining Diffuse Congruence. But um, yeah, you were one of the one of the original original guests, and um, I guess folks can go back and listen to that to get a little more history. But yeah, uh, for we're sure, gonna, we're gonna we're gonna touch on that a bit. I mean, like. You know, even before me, congratulations to both of you and to the show, right? 150 episodes and this many years. I talk to a lot of startup projects, a lot of startup <laughs> podcasts, a lot of new ideas. And to see something go, to grow so much over time and to stay persistent is is incredible. So before even my time at CARE, congratulations to both of you. That means a lot. Thank you. That Thank you so much for saying that. Alhamdulillah. I mean, you know, it's like, yeah, I remember in 2013, you guys really like, can, can we talk to you? I was like, yeah. Right. yeah. Now, 10 years later. And I should say, just as just as accessible as it was 10 years ago. So Alhamdulillah. Uh, kudos to you Alhamdulillah. for um, keeping that kind of a profile. It's it's wild. Like 2013 feels like a lifetime ago. I was like, who who was president back then? Yeah. Oh, Barack right. Hussein Obama. And we were in that post post Bush era. Things were... Not necessarily better than yeah. the Bush era, but it was different. But long enough into the into the Obama presidency that the that the honeymoon period had ended. That's the thing, yeah. right? Yeah. That the, the honeymoon period had ended. the The curtain had been pulled back, right? And we were drone bombing Yemen. There was still a very normal occurrence of FBI visits in our community. And the use of agent provocateurs to trap mentally ill and otherwise vulnerable Muslims in alleged terror plots. And the rise or the beginning of the rise of the Islamophobia industry. You mentioned 20, 10 years since 2013. The other thing that comes to mind is, um, I think, tell me if I'm wrong, but was the Arab Spring kind of one of the early uses, use cases of social media exposing kind of what's going on on the ground? Yes, that's when a lot of us joined social media or joined like different platforms, mm -hmm. right? To follow along. It's where many of us were getting live updates. And in some ways, that is a trend that has stuck. People have moved from company to company or mm -hmm. preferred platform to preferred platform. Even just today, I'm watching the encampments on the college campuses and there's a debate about whether you watch on Instagram live <laughs> or you watch on TikTok, so mm -hmm. long as TikTok remains accessible. But it's been incredible to see how we no longer have to turn to corporate media or mainstream media to see who earns their spot in the evening news. Instead, we can connect with people all over the world. Yeah, you know, and one of the other things you, you referenced um, just got me thinking because literally this past weekend, uh, a few of us, uh, you know, who happen also to be lawyers, we were talking about some of the uh, entrapment cases that you ref that, that you referenced, and I think to our knowledge, or at least you know, we we couldn't come up with a single case where that's really been overturned. I think there was the one in Lodi. Right? Was that that was entrapment in a sense, right? With um Yes. Um Hamid Hayat. Hamid Hayat, yeah. Does walk free now. Okay. 
And so there are some, you're right. That's it. I'm so glad that your memory is better than mine. There are some where people have either served out their sentences or there's been a review of the case as was the situation with Hamid Hayat. And, you know, he now is restarting his life after so many years in jail, but there are still so many people, both um, victims of entrapment plots, as well as people who were prosecuted in the post 9-11 like terror era, right? So the, the yeah. case I always come back to are like the Holy Land Five. Yeah. These the founders of the Holy Land Foundation at the time for you know for for people who don't remember the largest American Muslim relief organization who were being from Texas, I remember them well. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Right. So you're yeah. from Texas. Yeah. And they're still Right. So some of them were deported and then yeah. some of them are still serving out their sentences. And there has been so much effort made to have those cases reviewed on appeal and court after court has declined. Right. Mm. Or like um, Samuel Arian, right? I mean, I, I think. Samuel Arian um, yeah. now lives in Turkey. That's right. I don't think he's, ele allowed, he's allowed to. He's not allowed back in the United States. Right. And um, a couple of weeks ago at one of the encampments in New York, um, there were mainstream media outlets that were smearing his family members that were visiting the visiting the encampment. Um, really? Yeah, there was this this whole thing that was spread online about like the relatives of a known terrorist, and that narrative Is was it? used to justify the way police force um, in that specific instance was used on the encampment. I was thinking, like, because I, I know his son-in-law has been pretty outspoken about all of this, right? And Professor so, Brown is incredible. Absolutely. Um, Layla's husband. And and so I was thinking maybe this was, like, blowback for some of that because I know people are always, at least on social media, sort of trying to use that as a gotcha. Like, oh, your father-in-law was so-and-so. That would not surprise me. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, it's I would say it's even bigger than the one family. It is that mainstream media – is in instances like this no different than right-wing media and even moderate elected officials have been utilizing the talking points that label Arabs and Muslims as terrorists, um, guilty until proven innocent. Um, yeah, I mean, again, we can go on so many tangents, uh, but, I, I, you know, I think we were asking, or yeah, just about sort of your, you reflecting back on your, how long has it been now? So... Uh, it'll be 15 years this fall at, at CARE. So okay. 2013, I was about four or five years into the job. And, you know, coming of age as an activist when Bush was president and then coming into the Muslim nonprofit sector when Obama was president, it was so hard to to see just how many horrible things were happening in our community. And at the same time, how many people felt comfortable and relaxed because, at least we had a Democrat in office at the time. Since then, right, we've seen that that what was at the time like a right wing fringe Tea Party became the loudest voice in the Republican Party. We went through four years of a Trump presidency. We survived a global pandemic. And now we're in like our seventh month of a genocide. I, I don't know if we want to get too deep into this just yet, but you, you, you're, you're you kind of told us the history. And I think about like, we had Democrat, Republican presidents. You would think like, oh, with these guys in power, it's going to be good. And with these, ba but there's all these kind of downstream effects mm -hmm. in a way when Trump was president, mm -hmm. you got a lot more like camaraderie with the Muslim community Yes, versus with Biden now, nobody's really on guard. Right. So that camaraderie, camaraderie is kind of gone in a sense. Well, to the degree could that you it, define camaraderie, right? I mean, and you well, kind of agreed. So maybe how y'all the enemy kind of, of of my enemy is my friend or whatever. You know, right? To, right basically, right. what I'm saying oh. is like everybody was kind of together. There's a sense of togetherness amongst like minorities, if you will, because right it's disenfranchised people. So what we today Trump, consider yeah. right wing pro Israel groups, like mm -hmm. pro genocide groups, like the Anti Defamation League, were running to be friends with Muslims mm -hmm. when Donald Trump was elected president. Right. I still remember that. One of the leaders of the Anti-Defamation League, um, the ADL for short, was like, if there's a Muslim registry, I'll sign up. And I was like, bro, t like keep your registration. Like, We don't want pro-genocide, pro pro-Israel people on our registration list. And that, the enemy of my enemy, right, is, yeah. is my friend. And so you saw across the spectrum on the so-called left, mm -hmm. everybody 
wanted to fight Trump. Yeah. And because Muslims were target number one, or among the top three targets for his administration, everybody was partnering with us. Everybody was wanting right. to support us. And it's very different as compared to today, where moderate Democrats are effectively pro-genocide, mm -hmm. pro-Israel, like, yes, let's send more money, more weapons, more all of this. And what we hear from them repeatedly is, we were just talking to a legislative staffer and he said, you know, my boss isn't going to move until the commander in chief moves. And so what comes, what, what it comes down to often for me is that for so long as we're stuck in this two party system, mm -hmm. right. you almost need the parties opposing each other for there to be some safety for minority or un or otherwise politically unpopular communities. I believe that if we had a Republican president today doing exactly what Biden is yeah. doing, that the Democratic majority in Congress would fight him tooth and nail. And we saw that when Bush was president, people were rallying, elected officials were rallying. When Trump was president, we saw that again. But when Obama was doing exactly what Bush did, right, it was like, oh, great. But like, you know, at least he's not Bush. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. With Trump, it's always a little unpredictable, though. He could kind of go in multiple directions. Like, I think just this past week, he kind of doubled down on um, on Israel, effectively, by, by saying, how could you stop arms and whatnot? So, he's, he's a little unhinged in that but sense. I don't think he's unhinged. I think he's also, like, racist, right? And mm -hmm. all for violence against people of color, communities mm -hmm. of color, women – that's predictable. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying we could also account for is that if Trump were in the Oval Office right now, the Democrats would push back against him. Um, and that's the part, right, that right. I think has us in this difficult moment right now is so many of the Democrats who opposed Trump and stood with the Muslim community Right are today giving Biden and as a result, the Israeli government a blank check. Like literally it's, we have to follow what the commander in chief says, but they wouldn't follow the commander in chief it, if it were Trump. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I see your point, but I think, I mean, again, you raised so many issues and I think we might as well like to, I'm going to go back to what you said, um, dive right in, mm -hmm. and, you know, rather than just kind of, I, I know these are yeah. things that we wanted to bring up a little later in, yeah. the, in, the, in the show's outline, but nonetheless, I think, I think it's really important because you, you do bring up so much. I, I think it also what 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 you described, you know, vis-a-vis -vis like Trump administration or, or or how Muslims were responding during the Trump years versus how they're responding now, how other organizations or other groups viewed Muslims now versus back then. It it raises this it, it raises a question that I did want to ask you, which is around partnering, like the calculus that Muslims use to ally or partner with other organizations or other movements, sometimes those can be a little precarious. Mm -hmm. Whether it's like like you were saying, the ADL willing to come out in defense of Muslims back during the Trump years, but now we know where the ADL is. We've always known where the We've ADL always, is. So, they thought we forgot. <laughs> but I like I like you how you made that point though, which is like even back in the Trump years, it's not like we simply say, okay, welcome, Alan, anyone who who is, you know, the enemy of my enemy. Mm -hmm. There was still at least, you know, at least from you individually, perhaps, or as CARE as an organization, to be like a little reticent to jump on board with the ADL just because they were speaking our language. Right. Now, what would you say to then, by that same analysis, if you will, or discretion that was applied, to Muslims who say, well, we should apply that same discretion to organizations or movements or in, where they there are certain things that are contrary to normative Islamic principles. Namely, for full like candor, like around issues of gender and sexuality. It's a it's a good question. Um it's a panel of, like so between I think June twenty twenty two and October twenty twenty three. Right, so about a eighteen, a little less than eighteen months, June twenty twenty two to October twenty twenty three. I was getting this question about how do Muslims navigate the LGBTQ issue at one point once a week, and then it felt like it was every day. Right. And what was what specifically about that time frame? I think it was that Pride Month, right? Um, mm, June, in well, June twenty twenty two, kicked yeah. it off. Okay. And we saw different than June twenty twenty one. 
<laughs> maybe post post COVID, COVID like post um, summer uprisings for yeah. Black Lives Matter, right? And yeah. so I don't know what it was, and yeah. I think there's a number of factors, okay. right? Is that right wing targeting of LGBTQ groups increased? Mm. Right. So that meant that the pushback, right, in, yeah. the, in the same way with any community, you target them, they're going to push back. Right. So you saw the pushback for that. You saw a lot more openness around LGBTQ issues. You also saw a lot of people feeding into homophobia for mm-hmm. a, a significant period of time. And so I was getting this question maybe once a week. And then I remember in 2023, it felt like I was getting it a couple of times a week. Sometimes it was once a day. Like, oh, how do I talk about this? What do I do at school? What do I do at work? Why are you mm-hmm. talking to these organizations? What are you doing? And then in October 2023, when the Israeli genocide in Gaza began, we knew that the community's focus had shifted because we stopped getting those questions for a little while. I actually remember when it occurred to us, it was like, wow, today was the first day in weeks I hadn't gotten any mm. questions about it. It was like, oh, this is a whole week that we went by. I know I'm, also during that period, I mean, we saw, like, for example, parents speaking out at, at school board meetings. We saw it in Michigan, where mm-hmm. it was largely led by Muslims. I think that's that same time period. It's that whole same time yeah, period, right? exactly. And so I, I raise this to say... No, I'm, I'm glad it, you raised it. It's... And there's a, there's a, sorry to interrupt, there's a bunch of other kind of anecdotal stuff. Waitlist to Muslim schools skyrocketed, oh, right. Right, for right. example. Right, right. Um, yeah. I didn't so that. there's, there's all these different metrics out there, yes. like, uh, yeah. you know. Yeah, the, the waitlist at Islamic into. schools was through the roof. Yeah. Like, you could not get into an Islamic yeah. school if you weren't put on the list when you were born for, <laughs> a, for quite some time. The normative Islamic position on these issues is generally well understood. And I'm not a scholar, so I'm, you know, not sure. going to double click into like, what is the fic on mm-hmm. homosexuality or transgenderism? What, where I think we get stuck is at times is, okay, you can disagree with someone's personal life. You can disagree with their urges. You can disagree with their decisions, but that doesn't allow you to harm them. Okay. And that doesn't allow them to harm you. And so I, I make a distinction between somebody who is pro LGBTQ and a Zionist who wants to kill you, right? And so that's when we come to the question of the ADL. The mm. ADL is not like I want you to change your religion or I disagree with your religion. The ADL is I want to kill your people, and I want well, no, I should watch them come after me. Um, I support a, a country that wants to kill your people, right? And so we have to ask ourselves like. Can we work with people where we agree to disagree? And then what are the red lines? Right. Racism, um, settler colonialism, genocide are all red lines. Versus in every instance when I've worked with an LGBTQ partner, either as an individual or an organization or in a movement, they're not asking me to change anything about my faith or my religion. They're just asking me to support their ability to live free and safe. Although playing... Please, devil's yeah, yeah. advocate here. The pushback you have within Muslim circles, the conversations that occur, is that by you sort of either tacitly approving of the lifestyle or acknowledging that it is a legitimate way to live, is in and of itself compromising your religion. There, there's so many ways that we could unpack this. We'll probably spend our whole hour here. The so coexistence is not the same as tacit approval okay. and cooperation is not yeah. the same as tacit approval. Right. It always like, it, it, again, like want to be very clear, not a scholar here. Right. The, I mean, the, none here, of us are, so right. we can navigate here's, it. Here's as what comes late. up for me yeah. is the biggest sin in our faith is shirk. Okay. And yet we coexist with Christians without assuming tacit approval of the Trinity. Mm. And so why can't we coexist? with LGBTQ individuals. They, right, also don't agree with our perspective on our faith. They don't agree with our, like, rigidity around he- being heterosexual. Sure. And and by the way, and, and here's the other thing, that there's so many layers to this. And no, no, that's like, a great it's point, the, though. The, and, and actually, the reason I raised that point, and it sticks with me, is more than 10 years ago, we invited Glenn Greenwald before mm-hmm. he went down the Fox News yeah. thing, mm-hmm. right? And he was on the front lines of national security surveillance and just as a civil rights advocate, we invited him to keynote our gala. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I remember um, we had an internal conversation of like, wait, yes. but he's out and right. gay. Right. So how how does he speak at your gala? And so there were two things that came up about that, right? Is, well, he's speaking about the things we agree on. 
which are surveillance, civil liberties, right, and protecting each other. And and it, he's, he's not here to speak about his sexual orientation or his marriage or any of that. He's here to speak about the things that we agree on. The other thing that somebody said that always sits with me is, how many Christians have you had on your stage? Right. They are committing the worst right. sin in our faith, right? right? Associating partners or children with God. And yet, we're able to agree on certain things. And so, I don't see coexistence, cooperation, right. and even partnership at times as tacit approval of something. Right. And very clear that this is what my interpretation of my faith says. This is what the majority of scholars who are Muslim say. But you're also my neighbors. Right. You also have kids who go to school with my kids. Right. And where the partnerships end up happening are like, you know, hate crimes legislation protects all of us, gay or straight. In fact, some of the best hate crimes legislation that we've seen in the last several decades has emerged as a result of violent hate crimes targeting LGBTQ individuals. And so, hmm. why wouldn't we advocate for safety for everyone? Our faith doesn't permit vigil any justice, doesn't permit hate crimes. Yeah. The other, the thing that I want to lift up that I, you know, I, whenever we have this conversation, I'm always, I try to really be mindful of the fact that I I live a privileged experience as a heterosexual Muslim woman. There are members of the Muslim community who identify as LGBTQ. And so that's the other thing I always want to be careful of with my language here is that this is not a community that is, uh, these are not people that are separate and apart from our community. There are people who sit in both. And yeah, that's un undeniable. Right. And so like right. we, how, we, we can't deny yeah. that they exist. We can't, I mean, and in some cases, they take an interpretation of the faith that we might disagree with, right? right? An interpretation of the faith that says that their choices are permissible, but they are still believers. They are still people who come to our misogyny, and they are still yeah. people who deserve to be safe. I think you, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm just going to say, I, I think you, you beautifully highlight, I think, uh, some inconsistencies we see with those who I was sort of channeling when I said, I'm going to play devil's advocate. That is, let's say. They're going to get so upset that you call them devil's advocate. <laughs> so just, you're, you're gonna no, I was playing devil. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm calling them devils. You're right. Yeah, you're, you're right. That's why, I, you know, um, Osama, God bless him, used to say angel's advocate. Mm. That way, you know, if you're not, right. It's, so, a, it's, it's hard because devil's advocate is too harsh and angel's advocate is too generous. It's, so it's just right. something in between. <laughs> Yeah, Language just, is imperfect. Yeah. We got to think of a better phrase. Um, but no, no, because I think you highlight some of the inconsistencies just based on principle alone that, um, that, that this sort of exemplifies those, let's say, conservative voices or what have you within our own community that do bring up these issues. Because like, for example, with the Glenn Greenwald example, I, I couldn't help but think that, and again, I was playing angels, devils, whatever, mm -hmm. human advocate, because in my mind, I was thinking, well, it's interesting because I think they would essentially, those same voices wouldn't have a problem with you inviting Glenn Greenwald, as long as he was going to be speaking on those very specific issues, not related to... But they I did. That's why I had to go get the religious opinions okay, on it. They did. Okay, fine. But they, those same voices, though, would be loud and clear also if you invited, or you, you have invited, Ilhan Omar. Mm -hmm. Because of her position on LGBTQ issues. Right. So, what we've seen. So, do you, you see what I'm saying? It, like, the what inconsistency. What we've seen is this like growing. If I were to play advocate on the other side, right? I, I hear that like the parents that call me with these questions, the community leaders that call me with this que these questions, what they're worried about is their children losing their faith, right? What they're Fair. worried about is their children being influenced. And what I think that awakens in them is like a very protective sure. layer. And that's maybe the difference between what's happened in the time span from when Glenn Greenwald graced our stage to our work with Ilhan Omar is mm. people have become more fearful. And that's that's such a hard place to work from. Ultimately, I don't know that we can shield our our children from the world around us. Indefinitely from the world around, yeah. Yeah, that's I'm going to get point. into so much trouble for no. all this whole thing. No, hey, no, not you guys. It's just, yeah. We might get in trouble uh, or canceled or whatever. You know, the, <laughs> I think about like how for uh, Muslims have been pretty much predominantly Democrat for the past 
20 plus years um 20, 20? 22 20, 20 yeah 20 22 23 years right yeah. 20 plus years oh, for yeah, sure right. since Sorry, the, the, but no but but the kind of the distinction between hey your red line is genocide um and then that resulting and we can get into the uh, biden right people saying hey i'm for the first time in my voting adult life i'm not going to vote for biden there's other people looking at that and go what like how the heck could you not vote for biden because the alternative trump but in a sense, if your kind of your red line is genocide, well, they're both kind of supporting that. So, it's, it's the, in terms of the priority issue, is there a difference? And and it's more of a question. It's more I'm kind of observing, and then I'm, I want to hear your thoughts and too. They're, they're and I think you also murderers. sorry. <laughs> I said they're equal opportunity murderers, right? And I think what you also said earlier, um, you know, almost in passing, but therein lies the inherent problem of a two party system where you're left with these two choices only right because any alternative choice is either a no vote or a vote for whoever your state is going to predominantly go for so for example in california you can vote you know uh cornell west but at the end of the day we know that the state is going to go to biden which is why i always say hey uh, this election i had the luxury of being in california I don't have to make that choice of oh, like, that, okay, do I vote uncommitted, but then put Trump in office? Uh, it's a luxury in a way. Absolutely. I mean, the thing is, we were already seeing parts of the Muslim community leaving the Democratic Party. Oh, yeah. Before the Israeli genocide in Gaza began. For sure. Specifically on this question of gender norms and sexual orientation and the quote unquote 100%. family values. Mm -hmm. And right. so there was a lot. I don't, I don't know that the data exists. I can say that anecdotally. I was hearing from a lot of people who were like, oh, I'm never oh, yeah. voting Democrat again. Right. The Democrats are too progressive. The Democrats, you know, and, and it's hard because the sentiment in the Muslim community is the Republicans want to kill us and the Democrats want us to change our faith so yeah. that we no longer exist. And that that's, that's how I was hearing it from people right. as they were exiting the Democratic Party. Now, with the genocide in Gaza, people, let's call them, and language is so imperfect, I think I'm going to struggle with this all night, right? So let's call them the politically moderate Muslims or okay. politically moderate American Muslims. So not politically and religiously moderate. So they're not so conservative that they're leaving the Democratic Party over gender norms or sexual orientation. But they're praying and they identify as Muslim and they've got a live and let live perspective. Got it. They're now leaving. Because of the genocide, genocide. in Gaza. Yeah. And so we are stuck is what a lot of people feel like. And I should note here, right? Speaking in my personal capacity, even though oh, yeah, most right. of the time I'm talking about care, but just what I'm hearing from friends and family yeah. and from people who are organizing. And is you're that comfortable kind of navigating, you know, Yeah, going we're just going to take the hat on and put it off and the hijab and it's going to switch. And, and if it's, um, I guess if it makes your life easier after this recording, you, you may want to make, throw in that language sure. every time you do it. Like yeah. here, here I'm, here I'm going to be speaking with <laughs> yes. my care hat on. Yeah. Here yeah, I'm going to yeah. be speaking with, you know, right. as uh, Zahra Billu. So, I can say with my care hat on that the community is really conflicted. And, you know, I, I still remember when people first said genocide Joe, yeah. right? Like that, that phrase. And now it's like, now it's common usage. It was a bit jarring. Now it's just how, you, and now, by the way, it's how the crowds at Trump rallies also refer to yeah. him, which is funny. Like there's video of them chanting oh, yeah. it, and, even and, though. And Trump egging them on. Right. Even yeah. though we know he would be as genocidal in office as possible. And so where exactly. I'm coming at this from, you know, from our work at CARE is it is incredibly concerning that more and more people feel disconnected from their elected officials. And as a result, may not turn out to the polls, not just on the question of president, but all the way down the line, mm. because it's not just the president that has disappointed the electorate. It is members of Congress. It is these city councils that like, you know, there's been this incredible movement of ceasefire resolutions from city council to city council. And what amazes me is there's no teeth to the resolution. It is entirely symbolic. symbolic. And yet some of these city council members want to both sides mm -hmm. a genocide or want to find ways to opt out. And so the the bigger issue is not just who will be president in the next four years. It is 
What does our community's power look like? And how will we leverage that? And so the argument I've heard is if Biden wins without consequence for the last seven months, then what power does the Arab and Muslim and pro-Palestine like electorate hold? Right. And if Trump wins, the genocide continues and he potentially deports many, many people. And so people are navigating this. And what I worry about getting lost in all of this is what about the down ballot races? Right. right. Like, what about ongoing civic engagement? What about the fact that, like, we have to keep showing up? Um, and so it's it's rough out there. That's a good point that I never thought of because, yeah, the the consequences of voting, whether you end up voting for Trump or you end up not voting or you end up voting for a third party or you just say, you know what, I'm going to hold my nose and I'm going to vote. Uh, I'm going to vote Biden. Is that that oftentimes has consequences down ballot or people who just vote party line right. exclusively right right down the ballot so no that's a really interesting point um, and it matters so much yeah. because like so as we're recording um and really in the last several weeks across the country and hopefully it'll continue there's been this like movement of college campus encampments sure. right over 2500 people have been arrested at campus protests in the last several weeks now who makes that charging decision the district attorney. That is an elected official. So the cops show up, they arrest people, right? Eventually, the district attorney's office has to decide, are we dragging them to court or not? Are we continuing with this like disproportionate punishment of peaceful protesters? Are we wasting you know, local resources in this way? That's an elected official. Yeah. Where do you find the district attorney on the ballot? Like way down at the bottom. <laughs> right. People don't pay attention to that race, but yeah. that race matters so much. That's and right. I want to, since you, since, um, since you mentioned the protests, I think it makes sense to level set a bit and go back to the, you might have some insight, uh, and which is why I'm asking this question. What was the spark that, uh, that lit that fire, I guess? Um, be, the reason I'm asking is- That as, fire as in the as in college the, protests? The, 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 the protests, right? Okay. What, was the, what was the spark that ignited that? Um, I'm asking because today when you look at video clips, you see a lot of Muslim students, mm-hmm. a lot. And it's 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 actually- it's nice to see that Muslims are going to some of the best universities in the country. Um, but I don't, I'm curious, did, is, was that a Muslim led, uh, spark or was there, or was there something else that kicked off? Was it in Colombia? Maybe you can give us kind yeah. of a, a, a rundown of, of the beginning of that, of that, uh, protest history. So today's protesters stand on the shoulders of the giants who came before them, right? And I always mm-hmm. just like want to, like, protest is, American tradition. Protest on college campuses is American tradition. And protest for Palestine is something that has been happening for a very long time, right? Mm -hmm. So students have been advocating for boycott, divestment, sanctions on their college campuses for many, many years, more than probably two decades. I remember when I was in college, now 20 years ago, we would organize Palestine Awareness Week. And if you were at a more radical campus, we would organize Israeli Apartheid Awareness Week. And so there's been a lot that's been a lot happening before this moment that sets the stage, that creates tradition, that creates um, even cultures, right? That's important. And then there's a lot of credit to Colombia, and I'll come to Colombia in a second, but I always, in talking about this moment in time, start with Stanford, which had the first encampment for Palestine. And most people don't realize this, but they started last fall in October 20, October, November, October, 2023. And they went for 120 days through winter break, through numerous storms. And they eventually reached a negotiated end with their university administration. And then Columbia started. And and, and quick question, was that like the Stanford MSA or was it the Stanford, like, what was that? It was a mix. It was a mix of students. And so we've actually seen What about, wait, October 2023. So that means, okay. Soon after the genocide started. Six, seven months ago, yeah. That would even predate what occurred at UC Berkeley, at at, at Dean Cherminsky's. Correct. Dean Cherminsky's house and his wife assaulting Malak is April 2024. It's like less than two uh, two months ago, okay. yeah. It hasn't even been a month. Yeah, it, it was, was the re- night before Eid. It was April 
19. Yeah, it was very 2024, recent. Oh, and wow. we're recording on the 15th of yeah, May. Yeah, right. it feels like so much has happened. It does. Okay, okay, um, okay. So, no, no, I, I really appreciate then you kind of level setting us. Stanford then. So Stanford has this 120-day encampment, and it is Muslim students, Jewish students. It's neither the MSA nor the SJP. It's a group of students that come together from both organizations and other groups and others. Um, a lot Jewish of people voices. will describe themselves as like autonomous groups of students or autonomous <laughs> groups of individuals and I think some of that may I think go back to if you all remember the Irvine 11 um, remember this was more than a decade ago a group of 11 UC Irvine students um, took turns interrupting the Israeli ambassador then Michael Oren Michael Oren right? right and they got dragged out by the police and they were put they were criminally charged and I believe at the time the MSA faced disciplinary consequences on the campus. Don't don't mm -hmm. quote me, sure. except I know I'm on the record. Um, and after that, we saw that as students engaged in different methods of agitation over the years on their campuses, they didn't do it through existing organizations because the blowback would be so consequential. And so Stanford has this encampment. It it winds down. Um, yeah. They over the course of their first 120 days face threats from law enforcement. They face physical violence from pro-Israel agitators on campus and off campus, um, and they face disciplinary threats from the university. So pretty much the whole gambit of what, what, what yes. we've been seeing. Everything exactly. Right? UCLA. Yeah. UC Berkeley. So they yeah. did it first. Stanford yeah. did it first. Okay. Um, okay. And I, as a public public university public school graduate, sure. I hate giving an Ivy League credit for doing it first, <laughs> but that is what it is. Um, what so, was the, what was the eventual agreement, though, right? Because, like, for example, today, I think, is when UC Berkeley reached an agreement with their encampment. So, you know, obviously, there's shades of wins. What, what, what are the strictures of the agreement that, for example, to your knowledge, that Stanford uh, My very to? vague recollection sure. is that they opened the door on conversations with the university. That that was like the big, mm -hmm. the Win. big thing there. That's, yes. And that you're saying that alone is a W. At that time it was. Okay. Yeah. okay. Right. Because at that time the university administrators weren't meeting with students. They weren't willing to have these conversations. And so a lot has changed. Has it? Because isn't UC Berkeley's like, for example, I, I haven't had a chance to read it, but I think my understanding is it's essentially the same thing. Well, so, so hear me out. So we go from Stanford sure, sure. to Columbia. Sure. And Columbia students launch an encampment. And to your point, Omar, um, mix of Muslim and Jewish. And actually what I've loved seeing at these encampments, the ones I've visited, is that we're talking 30 to 40 percent Muslim. I Some yeah. some of them are maybe 80 to 90 percent Muslim, I, but a lot of them mm -hmm. are 30 to 40 percent Muslim. It's a lot of Jewish individuals. It's also a lot of, by the way, LGBTQ individuals, mm -hmm. to, yeah. to your earlier point, who – who are standing up for human rights. And, yeah. and some of these organizations that I think should be highlighted, JVP being one, right? Jewish Voice for Peace, mm -hmm. uh, Students one? for Justice in Palestine, okay. um, which ev like everybody should know that name because okay. they have specifically been barred in like, for example, the state of Florida. They have been barred from different university campuses. In Florida, their CARE has a lawsuit that is active um, following the governor's barring of SJP. I believe the ACLU also has a lawsuit. So, Columbia launches an mm -hmm. encampment. Right. And, and can I stop you real yes. quick? Encampment for for people because we hear about protests. Right. Encampment. I'm 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 imagining people sleeping out, sleeping out on the lawns and stuff. Yeah. But when 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 does Tense. it? W can you define protest versus encampment? And at what is the actual? Uh, what 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 is tolerated? Like what? Because because I think there's people who think these are just people uh, holding up signs and. And so a that's corner. a protest. That's a protest. Right? And then there's people who are like, oh, they're disrupting the classes and whatnot. Right. And is is it is it's it somewhere rage. in the middle? Oh my God, it's, it's, ama it it's amazing how beautiful and creative it is, right? Mm -hmm. So like yeah. up until the Columbia it's so separate and aside from Stanford, separate and aside from that, up until Columbia, you get like students organizing teach-ins and town halls and protests and rallies. And they're doing a variety of things, mm -hmm. right? And they're facing repression by the way. In every instance. Mm -hmm. And so this is something that is very much parallel to what Palestinians experience, right? Israel says, well, if you protest peacefully, 
then that's okay, except Palestinians launch boycott divestment sanctions and Israel criminalizes the founders. Palestinians protest in the Great March of Return and Israel shoots at their legs. And so the same thing with these students, right? Mm. So we've, over the last seven months, received reports of students saying, I want to organize a town hall, but my university or my high school isn't letting me or they're putting me through all of these like requirements. You're hearing from students who, there was one campus where students walked through like a, a student union building and the next day the university was like oh no that was so disrespect like di disrespectful and disruptive and it was like so what is allowed and so every time people are speaking for palestine universities egged on by pro-israel groups are finding ways to make their lives challenging so you get a number of campuses where there are protests and then you get some campuses where there's a sit-in but maybe they're going home every day mm -hmm. okay what we see at columbia and what we had at Stanford prior is encampments. What does that mean? It means like they take over a part of the university. In many cases, it's starting in a free speech area on the university, right? Um, a plaza or some place that said, mm -hmm. you can do whatever yeah. you want here. Yeah. In many cases, it's parts of the university where you don't even need a permit to start out. But the students, to their credit, because they are so courageous and, and bold, are like, so we're going to pitch our tents here and we're going to stay. And that's immediately where they start to face issues from university like administrators who will say, well, you know, we have a curfew at 8 p.m. Or you're allowed to do whatever you want here, but you cannot sleep here. Um, and then you get pro-Israel groups also further agitating, saying, well, Jewish students feel really unsafe near these events, completely erasing the, f the reality that there are Jewish students who are pro-Palestine who are in the encampments. Right. Um, you know, there's like anti-Semitic language that's being used and it's like, where? Like, give us a specific thing. And there you see pro-Israel groups and right-wing legislators continuing to move the goalpost mm. on what is permissible language and what is not. The best example of this, of course, for everyone is the from the river to the sea, right? right? Israelis use it and Palestinians use it. Like everybody uses it and everybody has different meanings that they attribute to it. But Palestinians will say consistently, all this means is freedom for everyone from the river to the sea, not like an erasure of Jewish people from that land. And so universities start to crack down on the encampments. Um, in the case of Colombia, in addition to encampments, then you and you and you and you mentioned this because you said, well, it's it's it's, an, it's essentially students taking over a portion of the campus that begins with in free speech areas, like you said, like plazas, et cetera. But then it also becomes it like grows. buildings, yeah, it and grows. halls, right? Well, so so where do you draw the line as yeah. as Zahra Bilu, uh, <laughs> a civil rights attorney, and and where does you know where do you draw the line as? Like an, a, a care and advocate. the reason the reason I think that's important is because I think you have just to show the the polarity here. You have people who think, oh no, they're just peace, they're just like in a corner. But then you have you have the Fox News or worse viewers who are thinking like these college campuses are like Armageddon's. Like they have completely taken over. The buildings right. are on lo like right. chained right. up. I mean, right. so they have the, in their head. Right. There's a lot of people you'd be right. you know yeah that have this image of the head that these places are like complete so, um uh, like right. uh, chaos now. So right? anarchy. But, but anarchy. that's yes. the right word. I'm that's a little for, bit yeah. yeah. It's like two. I mean, slightly different questions because on the one hand, we're, you're, like you're describing what people's perception may be, mm -hmm. but I'm saying like they're, they're, like facts are mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. students did take over buildings right so at Columbia the hall I think right yeah, yeah, the, the Hind's hall Hind's yes hall. so Thank they you. named it after um right. you know young Hind who mm. her whole family was murdered around her and then the rescue workers who went to get her were murdered so she died by herself right. um, surrounded by her family's corpses so let's rewind for a second right at Columbia within the first I think 24 to 48 hours of the students camping out before they take over a building right Columbia president calls in NYPD to like arrest and brutalize the students. And so there, there's so much going on that it's it's like we we go straight to they took they took over a building. It's like, no, no, they were brutalized by the police first. Right. right? Um, there were lies spread about them first. They were targeted by agent provocateurs from pro-Israel groups first. And so students say, well, okay, like we're going to escalate, right? right? We're not backing down. You will not silence us, you will not intimidate us. Um, the first three people who were targeted at Columbia are all Muslim women. Um, all of whom, um, so there's Isra Hirsi, uh, Congresswoman Ilhan Omar's daughter, like the audacity, yeah. right, of arresting a Congresswoman's daughter. Right. And then there were two other women, both named Mariam, who um, were, were targeted. And so you get 
this like brutality. Then you get students who are suspended without explanation. They're given 15 minutes to collect their belongings and get out of campus because when a university suspends you, if you live there, you're also all of a sudden unhoused. Oh, yeah. So yeah. students yeah. say, okay, well, we're we're not scared. We're going to escalate, right? Mm-hmm. And so there is a process of escalation yeah. that is ongoing on all of these campuses. I don't know that I've ever seen a university where they've taken over more than one building. And the university where I think they held a building the longest might be Humboldt State University, which might have, I, I don't want to erase the Muslims there, but there are not that many Muslims in Arcata, California. <laughs> and what what perplexes me is the willingness of university administrators to brutalize their students before a building takeover, or even in the case of a building takeover, right? The tens of thousands of dollars that are being spent, um, the injuries that we are seeing, like just what what stops them? Like, what are they afraid of? And I'll tell you, because I'll, I'll come to this, right? So, we've, so Columbia thought that they would quash this encampment. After Columbia, we saw, I think, over 100 encampments in a week that went up across the country. And then they spread globally to Europe um, and Asia. And I remember at one point I saw a tweet that was like, every continent except Antarctica has an encampment. And Antarctica got one like two days later (laughs) because they were like, how dare you leave us out? (laughs) Over 2,500 students have been arrested. And the rhetoric from pro-Israel groups is Armageddon, anarchy, like anti-Semitism run rampant, completely erasing the Jewish presence of like Jewish presence in the encampments, themselves, um, yeah. allegations of anti-Semitism. And the only violence that we have seen has been the violence introduced by the universities, right? In our work at CARE. Or we, agitators from the pro-Israel correct. side. Yes, yes, like pro-Israel agitators and, and police officers. Yeah. Right. Um, in our work at CARE, what we advise people, and this is so hard because you want to be able to call the police to protect you. And so often it is the police who are introducing the gun to the scene. Mm -hmm. Like there's no gun in most cases until the police show up. And you know that they will kill first, injure first, ask questions later. Mm -hmm. Um, I could go on and on. But like the the thing about these encampments has been what are – and here's where I think so many of us are stuck. And hopefully all of your listeners have had a chance to visit one. If not, I strongly encourage it because they're just – They're beautiful experiences. I was at the one at San Jose State a little while ago. I've had the opportunity to visit Santa Cruz. Um, I've had the Santa Cruz, Stanford repeatedly, and Berkeley, right? And and those are just in the Bay Area. But there's more in the Bay Area and so many across the country is that, what are you afraid of? Like, you walk up to this and you're like, wait, that that's what they call police on, right? That's that's the Armageddon. Um, Here's what they're afraid of. And this is, this is, so frustrating, but last night, Sonoma State University reached a great agreement with their students. Um, probably one of the best ones we've seen thus far. Like, yeah. And within 24 hours, every major pro Israel advocate and organization in the state went after the Sonoma State University administration. And that university president is now on administrative leave. Wow. He issued yeah. his letter last night. That would have been, what's today, the 15th. So on the 14th in the evening, he issued it. Students welcomed it. They decamped, as they said. Uh-huh. Um, and we've seen a lot of decamping across the country, right? So sure. Riverside, Berkeley. Um, there's been a lot of like, what's a good statement? What's not? What's a win? What's not? Look, the Sonoma State University students said, this is the win we wanted right now. They reached an agreement. They were happy with his communication. Less than 24 hours later, that university president is on administrative leave. And so what are these universities afraid of? Pro-Israel groups. Um, One other example, by the way, that's just hilarious, and I'll get to the horrible. um, I think it's Pomona College in Southern California. The the administrators would not meet with the students. So the students are like escalating, right? Which, yeah, yeah, like if if my first encampment isn't good enough to place the pressure, I'm going to take over more space. I'm going to agitate common protest tactics like job negotiation tactics relationship tactics you just escalate till you get get the attention and so pomona college students i think took over the area around where the graduation stage was going to be set up rather than meet with the students pomona college decides we're going to bus our graduates and their families out to los angeles which is like a 30 plus minute ride out there um, I've heard estimates ranging from five hundred thousand dollars to a million dollars was spent on this alternative graduation the college could have just met with the students, right. but they refused to do that. Yeah. 
And then what we saw, I think, in you know, in Southern California, the last couple of weeks has just been so horrible. Right. At UCLA in particular, over several nights, pro-Israel groups um, were aggressive with the students, were violent with the students. One night, you know, there was a, a group of attackers who targeted the students through mm. firecrackers and pepper spray and bear spray and were just, like, ready to hurt someone. And the fact that there were... So many injuries should be no surprise, but students were rushed to the hospital with serious injuries. This is UCLA? This was at UCLA. You know, right. Now, there we even saw uh, these these uh, agitators or, or like the pro-Israel side breaking through the... Mm -hmm. the there was some, at so, UCLA, there were barricades up barricades, around the, around the camp. That's, yes. that's a better word. So who puts up those barricades? So at UCLA, yeah. the students had put up their own barricades to protect themselves because they had faced so much violence from outside agitators. Now, it's very different from... For example, a lot of the Bay Area campuses where you could really just walk on to an encampment and like you maybe there's like some rope or something and you just like pull it up and you walk. So it's we've been very fortunate in the San Francisco Bay Area to not see the kind of violence that Southern California saw. But at UCLA, the students put up barricades at a certain point. The students had um, a security system. You could only come into the encampment if someone else in the encampment would vouch for you. Mm. And why was that necessary? Well, because people were showing up with firecrackers to throw them at campers. Right. I and the police just watched, by the way. What you're highlighting, and, and you mentioned this right when you answered, I think when you began kind of talking about this, which is that, you know, these the, these protesters and slash protests stand on the on, on the shoulders of giants in the sense. And, and if, we're, if we look at that history, though, you know, the more that things change, the more they stay the same, as they say, like we go back to the 60s and whether it was right and it was the anti-war movement uh, where we saw protest of this kind on college campuses. Again, the state playbook was the same. Yeah. Bring in the, you know, the National Guard police to to crack down on the protesters. But by any means necessary, use of violence, use of uh, agitators internally. Right. So that we're seeing. Exactly the, the same. exact same. Exactly the same. Um, you're right. So, the more things change, the more they stay the same. So and that leads me, you know, with this idea of, or the idea of same playbook, if I could kind of build on that a little further. What is it then that the protesters, like we've talked a lot about agreements, what they've achieved, all of that. What is it that these protesters want today? Right, And, and especially because... On school these years. campuses specifically. Let's, yeah. let's, let's I want to, I want to, I want to um, yeah. be more specific. And, 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 and the school year is coming to an end, which right. is what I'm saying. So the right. clock is ticking for their so, ask, right? Yeah. The summer is encroaching. A lot of these students are going to go home. So what happens? So protesters before the campus mobilizing were yeah. calling for an immediate and permanent ceasefire. Okay. Right. And what does that look like for campus involvement? Students were advocating for, as they have, right, generationally in other issues, um, as well as on the question of Palestine, for boycott, divestment, and sanctions. From they, the university? They want the universities, no, no, so they want the universities to divest from companies that are profiting from the genocide in, in Gaza and or companies that are profiting from Israeli apartheid. Flesh that out by so, even giving hypothetical examples. Right, so University A uh -huh. has an endowment. That endowment is millions, if not billions of dollars. Well, that money is invested somewhere. Sure. Might be invested in weapons manufacturers, for example, Lockheed mm. Martin. It might be invested in companies that produce surveillance technology for the apartheid wall. And so students are asking for, and again, they've been asking for this for years, but they're escalating now. Our tuition right, at our tuition and or our universities should not be entangled in this. Our university should not profit from genocide. That, right, and so the the call to action at um, at these protests has been disclosed. So first and foremost, they're asking their universities, tell us where you're invested, then divest, right, and then defend the right to protest, the right to exist for Palestinians and, and so on. Um, and this is like where many universities are failing to even meet their students. Like what are they're, they're refusing to disclose their divestments or disclose their investments. And so step two is divest. Um, <laughs> right. And some of that has translated to like interesting specifics. There was one agreement where, you know, it's like the, there's a question of like Sabra Homos, uh, an Israeli company that is on, you know, 
a lot of people prefer to boycott because it's yeah. not authentic hummus and it's Israeli and so on. And so, but you see it, you see it at airports, you see it at university convenience stores. And so the students were like, Hey, like stop carrying that. Other examples include, of course, like foreign exchange and study programs is why does a university have an exchange program with universities in Israel, knowing that Arabs and Palestinians, Arabs and Muslims um, and non on Muslims of Palestinian background cannot go on those programs and that the universities there are engaged a lot of times in themselves upholding um, the okay. apartheid system. Right, right. Have you, to your knowledge, right, because this, and, and this would be a response directly to, again, criticisms, uh, unwarranted as we believe them to be, however they exist, which is that some of what the demands are, are quote unquote, anti-Semitic. To your knowledge, are there any calls for, for example, Jewish organizations on campus like uh, Hillel or others to be impacted? There, so I have been protesting for, attending protests for, advocating for, organizing protests for Palestine for over 20 years. Yeah. I have never seen anything anti-Semitic at any of these protests. What I have seen is people who are willing to weaponize anti-Semitism to silence critique of Israel. It's important to distinguish among Jewish organizations, right? So, so many of the leaders of the protests and the supporters of the protests have been groups like Jewish Voice for Peace. Right. And if not now, both Jewish-led organizations that are advocating for Palestine, and in the case of Jewish Voice for Peace, a explicitly anti-Zionist organization. Now, I want to distinguish those organizations from a group like Hillel, mm -hmm. where... Is, 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 is like Birthright part of the Hillel thing? Like, do they Birthright actually, is a separate organization. It's a separate organization. Okay, but so, they're also active on campus. Correct. So Birthright yeah. Yeah. takes students of Jewish ancestry mm -hmm. on fully paid trips, tours of Israel. Hillel labels itself like an organization and home for Jewish life on university campuses, okay. but has long excluded anti-Zionist Jews. And really? so, yes. And so there's and, like... And what is the lit the litmus test that The they litmus use? test is you have to be pro-Israel. You have to be Zionist. And that's not me. That is anti-Zionist Jews all over Twitter talking about how they didn't feel at home in Hillel or they were wow. asked to leave their <clears throat> concern about and critique of Israel at the door. And so it's hard because... Hillel labels itself, right? Like the home for all Jewish life on university campuses. Right. And yet you have some pro-Palestine encampments that are asking universities to sever ties with Hillel. And okay. then you have pro-Israel groups saying, well, that's anti-Semitic, except Jewish people themselves are saying, no, mm. Hillel wasn't home for me because I was critical of, I was critical of, of Israel. And this isn't something that's limited to college campuses when we talk about groups like the Jewish Community Relations Council, right? That brings together Jewish life and Jewish organizations and has synagogue members. The Jewish Federation, among its many functions, acts as a donor advised fund for Jewish donors, which then, right, moves money to groups like Birthright and, and Hillel. And then, of course, the Anti-Defamation League, which has long posited that it is a civil rights organization when, in fact, it is very explicitly, like, pro-Israel and, in fact, has directly done messaging to support the genocide in Gaza now and before has advocated for the surveillance and targeting of Muslims and Arabs right here in the San Francisco Bay Area Decades ago, there was a lawsuit mm -hmm. around the Anti-Defamation League partnering with law enforcement agencies to surveil people, law enforcement individuals who had gone rogue, to surveil individuals, and then handing over that surveillance to the South African government. It's like so convoluted that it's hard to believe, but, and that's why I always ask, like, right, it's not about whether or not the group is Jewish or not. Mm -hmm. We have many Jewish partners. Mm -hmm. It's what are their politics when it comes to critique of Israel. Right. Like another organization that you hear about, for example, but more it's certainly on the on the left side of the spectrum compared to the ADF, which is J Street. Mm -hmm. You know, what is the sort of their connection to Zionism? So um, J Street, and then remind me to come back to the American sure. Jewish Congress also. So oh. J Street, 
I think to put it. I know we're getting away from college. No, it's okay. It's, it's good, just, right? So J Street yeah. is arguably a pro-Israel organization, but maybe more moderate okay. than the Anti-Defamation League or the American Jewish Congress, or really its comparators might be like APAC. Um, right with a focus on on foreign policy um, and specifically U.S. policy around Israel, whereas like JCRC, JFED, and ADL are in many cases focused on happenings You're in right. the United I, when States. When I said ADL, yeah. I think no, I no, meant no, it's APAC, good. but it's in good. my mind, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. You know, J Street, I remember, y- takes congressional delegations to Israel, but my understanding is that they also do take them to visit the checkpoints. Um, so that the members of Congress that go do come back at times aware of what Palestinians are experiencing. But they're still a pro-Israel organization. The other group I want to mention because their name floats around in the Muslim community is the American Jewish Congress, a- AJC. And so Muslims will partner with AJC under the guise of interfaith work. Yeah. AJC also buys pro-Israel radio ads across the country, has targeted leaders like Sheikh Omar Suleiman, and is consistently advocating for more weapons, more funding, more supplies to Israel. And so to your, you know, remember we, we talked earlier about who we partner with and and who we work with. And ultimately, if at any point in your work you have advocated for violence against Palestinians, then that's a red line. Th- this latest group that you mentioned was the AJ- AJC? AJC. Okay. Not to mention names, but I think there was a, lar- a, a yes. rather substantial Muslim organization who I know you specifically were critical of without naming names. I can name names. I, I signed that publicly. <laughs> I can I can name names. Like, right, so ISNA. ISNA yeah. Um, no, so some people within ISNA okay. launched um, the Muslim Jewish Advisory Council That's right. in partnership with the AJC. And what was so hard about that moment in time for our community is that there were other people within ISNA who tried to course correct, who okay. said, wait a second, like, we didn't consult about this, like, this isn't okay. Yeah. And then there were several years of, like, obfuscation of what was happening. ISNA would say, well, we're not really involved in it. It's like, yeah, but your logo is still on their website. And ultimately, several dozen ISNA speakers signed a pledge to boycott ISNA until sure. ISNA said, okay, we're going to formally end our relationship. And we were like, wait, but you said, like, you've been saying you ended it. And it, and then they they did actually end it. What was hard about that is that they never acknowledged the harm that they caused. They never apologized for several years of obfuscation, and they never outright called AJC what it is, which in our perspective is a pro genocide organization that is actually deeply Islamophobic. Now Isna walks away from that partnership, alhamdulillah, right? Like we're so glad that that chapter has closed, but. There are many Muslims, leaders of a number of other organizations, who stayed on the Muslim Jewish Advisory Council. Their website was active until, I think it was just early 2024 that they took down the whole website. And I don't think they took it down because the partnership ended. I think they took it down because some of us kept calling out people for, like, how are you allowing your name and title and organization to be used Mm. um, to normalize with groups like the AJC as they actively advocate for violence against Palestinians. And I didn't think that the conversation would would necessarily go inward, but since we are talking sort of intra-community for a moment, there are other organizations that names come up when it comes to this issue of Israel. Two in particular come to mind. Normalizing. Normalizing, thank you. Two in particular come to mind, although there are others. Uh, One being um, MLI. Mm. And the other being M gauge. Mm-hmm. And I may be missing others, but these are, I think, the two big ones. Right. What is the criticism about these two particular initiatives slash organizations? So and why? MLI was not an organization, it was a project or endeavor endeavor of the Shalom Hartman Institute. What they did is take a number of self-identified Muslim leaders, initially primarily South Asian. Um, through a year-long fellowship during which I believe they studied Judaism, they studied Zionism, and then they visited uh, occupied Palestine twice um, in direct violation of BDS um, because you can go, but you're not supposed to go with Israeli groups, right? You're supposed to go with the invitation of Palestinians. You're not supposed to go with groups that are advocating against boycott, divestment sanctions in the United States, and the list goes on. And the participants came back. Now, to be clear, when you say you're not supposed to, let's define that, right? We mean not supposed to 
because it's unethical. It's, Correct. It's yes, immoral. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. And yeah. so, um, yes, that it's a, it's a good point, right? Is yeah. It's your permitted to go by law, <laughs> right. uh, but we will shun you and ostracize you there if you, you do. There you go. And so they yeah. came back from their trips, just in, in some cases, very vitriolic and, and pro-Israel, like condescending of Palestinians. And this was really heart-wrenching to see as a South Asian, because it'd be like, South Asians coming back from Palestine being like, I have the answer, and you've all been doing it wrong this whole time. Um, that program... I believe has been retired. I, there were a number of cohorts of people who went, who yeah. came back and really just like repeated pro-Israel talking points and were ostracized from the Muslim community to the Muslim community's credit. It was like, no, you can't speak at my mosque. No, you can't speak at my convention. Not right. while you're out here. Um, faith washing, right? Talking faith about how washing. that's the word is it like the, oh, yeah. like we're all going to like hold hands and do it together because we're all like the children of Abraham, yeah. except pro-Israel people are killing Palestinians. So that's the Muslim Leadership Initiative, and unfortunately, there were a number of high-profile Muslims who who went um, and who continue, by the way, on the speaking circuit with groups like AJC and and the ADL. Sure. And then there is Engage, well, and and so yes. in an ideal world, though, right? What would you like to see from these individuals, right? So who? there were there were some individuals who said we're so sorry we okay. didn't know okay. right or mm -hmm. we've changed our ways and so th that that is the ideal there is already a standard out there and I asked that, okay that's and that's and and I'm glad you said that because I think the because as you were mentioning like how rightfully so Muslims have or the Muslim community has ostracized these individuals brought up it, it brought up this whole question of cancel culture mm -hmm. I, I'm glad that even in your like n n and I don't mean you mm -hmm. I mean I'm glad that there's at least a pathway to forgiveness, a of pathway course. to reconciliation, a pathway where that cancellation doesn't become permanent Correct. and doesn't become uh, life ja damaging and career damaging. There no, is no. All a, of these people have done really well for themselves with book deals and TV shows and well, things no, like no, that. No, no. What I mean is like if, if oh, right, right, right. After saying, you know, a after the mea culpa. Correct. Okay. Got it. Yeah, right. So we, what is what is the the Brian Stevenson quote? We are all better than the than our, our worst mistake mm -hmm. or something, right? Mm -hmm. Public harm requires yeah. public apology. Okay, and we say that whether we're talking about imams who are abusing children and women, right? And like they have got to go through treatment, they've got to apologize, right? Like there's you, you can't just come back. You've got to do things. Um, you have to prove that you are better and that you are no longer. And that's a much more severe example. Sure. But is it, right? Like we're talking about yeah. individuals who have gone and, you know, cooperated with people who are Killing. harming other Muslims. Yeah. And so public public harm requires public apology. And it also requires course correction. Right. So you can't just be like, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know, but I'm going to keep doing that, yeah. right? Um and enjoying all the benefits that that entails. Right. Yeah. The access, the privilege, the name recognition, like the yeah. speaking circuit. Right. Right. No, because I, I appreciate that because I think this, uh, you know, again, I didn't think that the conversation would go there, but this broader issue of cancel culture where, and those who sort of deride it as being, right, I mean, who just deride cancel culture in general, I think missed this little nuance that, look, we're not saying that this is a life sentence. We're mm -hmm. saying that... You know, like you said, public harm demands public apology mm -hmm. and a changing course. Mm -hmm. And what does that changing, of course, look like? So I, mm -hmm. I you know, I, I think this nuance is, is really critical. Um, sorry, you were gonna, you were gonna respond to M Gage or talk about M Gage, and then we can shift the conversation. Yeah, I mean, I think again. that M Gage is is a harder question because they do important work, mobilizing voters, supporting candidates, and building power in the Muslim community. Unfortunately, a number of their leaders have previously and currently associated with pro-Israel groups like the Anti-Defamation League, like the Muslim Leadership Initiative, and like the Muslim Jewish Advisory Council of the AJC and formerly ISNA. And so public harm requires public apology and course correction. For example, um, one of their leaders, board members, founders went on the Muslim Leadership Initiative trip, was confronted about that. And eventually, Engage put forward a policy that said, nobody else can go on this trip. But you kept him on your board. Mm. 
And there was no public apology for his participation in the trip, either personally or through the organization. Fast forward, and one of your current leaders sits on the Muslim Jewish Advisory Council, that partnership that we talked about with the AJC, is on their website using their engaged title and picture. That's not course correction, right? Like just because you've changed some policies internally, if there's an ongoing partnership with people who are pro-Israel, then you haven't actually gotten better. And so engage is hard for me because they, they do important work and we need the voter mobilization efforts that they put forward. And at the same time, until and unless they clean up the track record and activities of their leadership, people are going to continue to have questions about whether or not they can trust them. What about, you know, you, you talked about partnering with Jewish or, or Zion, pro-Zionist yeah, organizations. Yeah, let's be really clear, right? Right, right. Yeah. And, and I know where this is, like, basically what I'm asking is about that red line, right? We talked about earlier. Where you drew the line was, look, pro-LGBTQ groups, that's one thing. Pro-Zionist groups, an entirely different thing. I, there's also, what, what, do we mean, what do we mean when we say partnership, right? right. So I will right. work with because LGBTQ groups on I hate crimes legislation. What about an individual who, yes, hasn't partnered or sat on the board of an AGC, but they have sat on the board of a pro-LGBTQ group, for example, or has partnered with that group? But that's like, not the thing. Is, so, is the public demand, is the public apology. But that's not the thing that we're seeing happen. Thank you. Right? So you're yeah, not seeing the leaders. So the Muslim leaders that get categorized as like too far left Thank because you. they work with LGBTQ individuals at times, you don't see them at pride parades in most cases. I Obviously, some people have gone, but that's right. And I'll say this is someone who like is sometimes facing that label myself. Like she's too progressive. She's too left. Like she like doesn't have any like red lines in her face. It's like, you've never seen me at a pride festival. I'm not on a, I'm not on a Muslim LGBTQ advisory group. There are other people who are, and those are their choices. Right. And people are drawing red lines around that. Okay. But you've got people who have gone to Israel with pro Israel groups. You've got people who are sitting on boards that are specifically normalizing pro-Israel relationships. And so the word partnership is thrown around a lot, mm -hmm. but doesn't convey the very many types of relationships that exist. But yeah, you're not seeing. Sorry. And, uh, you know what I remember? I remember yeah. that after the Orlando nightclub shooting, oh, yeah. where um, a Muslim shooter went on a rampage in an LGBTQ yeah. nightclub, many of us were called to solidarity actions, right? Yep. And so, I went mm -hmm. to anti-hate vigils. Right. I went to LGBTQ centers to like stand with them and say, hey, like nobody gets to shoot anybody. Nobody's so faith permits that, yeah. right? right? But I remember that somebody reached out to me and was like, and it was somebody from the Muslim community who was like, okay, great. So like, can we go to Pride Festival now? And I was like, no, there's a difference between standing against violence and mm -hmm. in solidarity when we're being targeted versus a festival that celebrates something that I, I don't believe in. You know, before we before we wrap, I want to yeah. kind of get your perspective on the broader implications mm -hmm. on the Muslim community of what's happening. Like, we kind of dissected what is happening, but I always like to kind of zoom out, especially as a parent, uh, but just even as a kind of a watcher of, of culture. Um, what I'm seeing... And you and and you can you can definitely comment because you get questions from parents and whatnot. What I'm saying is, for the first time, young people are caring about stuff that they never cared about cared about before, um, and it's almost hip in a sense. It's almost like the the from from a young person's perspective, it's the right thing to actually support this. So they're not they're not completely bread and circus like they were before. I, I want to hear your perspective on that, especially because you probably get. Uh, an insight from supporters of care, but you're also saying broadly by going to protest what's going on. We, and by we, I mean really anyone that is 35 or older at this point, maybe 30 or older, mm. never gets to speak ill of this generation of students. Never. We're just not going to be allowed to because they have proven themselves to be far more courageous than most of us are. Somebody said the other day, like, one way to end up in shackles is a mortgage because you don't want to lose your job. You don't want to be mm -hmm. doxxed. You, mm -hmm. Your lower back hurts. Your knees hurt. This generation of students has lit 
a fire under so many of us, mm. including those of us who are already activists or activist inclined. This moment in history has radicalized them in a way that we need it right now. In just seven months, we have seen just that we've seen such an incredible growth in the number of protests, the amount of organizing, the willingness of young people, and then by extension, their parents and family members and siblings to put everything on the line for what is right. Is it because they're not getting their news from like mainstream, they're getting their, they're getting really their from TikTok. social media. TikTok. Yeah. yeah. A, TikTok, a big right? part of it is that they can access. So a big part of it is that we are living through something that even those of us who are older have not lived through before. Right. We, of course, were alive during the time of the Bosnian genocide, but we didn't see it the way we see what is happening in Palestine now. Last year, I had the opportunity to visit Bosnia and, you know, walking through those museums that, memorialize what the Serbs did to the Bosnians is horrific, but there was nobody watching it yeah. on social media every morning. And so this generation of students and young people is seeing something that we haven't seen before and they cannot ignore it. They are choosing not to ignore it. And they understand the position of privilege that they have as people who are safe and sound and healthy and fed. And so they're taking action. And you think this, so, so obviously you have a sliver of college level folks, college level students, <laughs> if I, folks is probably the right word, <laughs> college level students who are um, active here, but you're, are you, are you feeling that this is going beyond that subset and into like the high schoolers and the, yes, and, Absolutely. Yeah. Like So, even before the encampments at college campuses started and became the trend, mm -hmm. um, students at high school campuses were wearing their kafias and wearing their watermelon yeah. t-shirts mm -hmm. and speaking out against teachers and organizing walkouts. One of the biggest student mobilizations in the San Francisco Bay Area before the college encampments or really like took hold mm -hmm. were high school students walking out of campus and organizing protests and and, right, so there's like the what's happening on school campuses at all levels. There's how people are dressing. It's almost impossible to find an authentic kefia because they're sold out all over the world. They are worn everywhere. And it's not just that. It's, you know, one of the things that's been people at the beginning of this genocide were looking to nonprofit organizations to organize the teach-in and organize the town hall and conduct, like, facilitate the meeting with elected officials. And eventually like or it's just become so organic and viral is that the right like that yeah there are we're recording on may 15th the day that is commemorated for the nakaba right the the great catastrophe that was the way in which israel was founded which by the way like we have now exceeded in the last seven months israel has committed more violence and killed more people and displaced more people than it did in 1948 when it was first set up but there were half a dozen protests and rallies in the San Francisco Bay Area just today within a 50-mile radius. Um, there were students taking over a building in Berkeley, and then there were students who forced the UC regents to shut their meeting down in, in Merced. And mm. there are people finding so many ways to engage. And so this moment has awakened something yeah. in young people of all faith and ethnic backgrounds. And by extension, in people of all generations, there's a really great video. Have you all seen this one of the the father at the USC encampment? Like the police raid the encampment at USC, and a reporter finds this dad, and he's uh, Mexican American. Hispanic, yeah, yeah, and he and the reporter is like, and he's like, my daughter's in there somewhere. Well, are you worried about her? He's like, well, if she gets arrested, I'll be really proud of her. Yeah, and it's. <laughs> And then it turns out that he was there with his dad. So there were three generations of this Mexican-American family at this encampment at USC. And wow. dad is cheering on his daughter as she's risking arrest. And so students have awakened something in, in all of us. Um, and and it's not just like, oh, that's there's something bad going on. There, there are more, there, there's almost like a consensus that this is super bad. And then there's active sharing on, and I'm speaking anecdotally, but there's active yeah. sharing on social media. And, and then to take it further, there's some actual 
boycotting. Like yes. the young, it's become like shameful for a young person to go to to go to Starbucks. Oh yeah, don't, I don't you, even like, know if <laughs> Starbucks is on the official BDS list. We can talk about that too. Right. Like no, you cannot. It doesn't matter how much caffeine you need. You had better not show up in certain places <laughs> with a Starbucks cup. And so right. we just had our Muslim day at the Capitol, where we take hundreds of Muslims from across California to Sacramento to meet I with really their legislators. Really wanted to come to that. Um, come yeah. next year, inshallah. Yeah, right. Inshallah. Like this year, we had over eight hundred and fifty. I think it was like. 860 people from across the state yeah. meeting with their legislative offices. And so right across the street from the state capitol is a Starbucks. Last year, that Starbucks was overrun by Muslims. Like mm. you were waiting 30 to 45 minutes for your drink. People were walking over. It, and it was just like, yeah, I need caffeine. It's hot. Like I, I want a cold drink. There was no one at the event this year with the Starbucks cup. Even if you weren't on board with boycotting Starbucks, you didn't want to be seen with that cup. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it's pl- it's it's proving true. I mean, you know, Starbucks released their quarterly er- earnings. Excuse me, uh, McDonald's did mm-hmm. right. It's it's it is impacting the bottom bottom line of these you know of these companies that are on these lists. And, and since we're on the subject of the list, though, I, I know this is something we talked about off air or off mic. Um, the, the, I think there was some. We had, yeah, we had a conversation around well, BDS in general. Yeah, and, I had a question and, because right. because. Um, you hear about BDS, and uh, yeah, you, you, I'm sure you know a lot about it, um, about the history and also the specifics of what we're, uh, what, what it, what it actually stands for. But you know, I've seen a, I've seen a website that has eight companies, and it's like Hewlett Packard, and it's like a few very, very specific list. And and then I also hear about Starbucks and McDonald's and this and that. And I didn't really understand how to reconcile the two. Um, what I heard from a friend actually in London, a friend of mine in London, uh, mm. who you you know who I'm talking about, mm-hmm. he said. It's from the what the Londoners, the the folks protesting in London, are just saying these are American brands and we're protesting what America is doing, and that's that's enough to mobilize a bunch of people there to say we disagree with America's mainstream position. This is an American brand. We're going to go to the local the local uh, chicken halal chicken place uh, uh, instead, and that and that's enough. But but from as an American, um, I'm really wondering like. Is there a responsibility to uh, to boycott Starbucks, for example? Because the CEO of Starbucks is saying that's all. It's not none of it's actually true. Yeah. It's just kind of become a, it's a myth that has taken the life of its own. And then you go to the website and you see only like eight companies on the list. So right. so help me understand what's true, what isn't, and um, reconcile those two yeah. lists. And if the answer is well no starbucks isn't on the list because of the fact that they actively contribute to the state of israel uh or support you know the um idf uh in any way if the answer though is well what they do is that they i think it was a uh, it was their stu- it was their union mm-hmm, right that mm-hmm. that that issued a statement and they came and they and they cracked down on that statement is that alone a reason for a company or a product to be mm-hmm. on the BDS mm-hmm. list? If so, why? Yeah. So let's, so, yeah. so BDS, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Zooming out like yeah, exactly. lay person version of this is Palestinian civil society says that we will urge our supporters to withdraw resources from, not do business with, and otherwise, right, distance themselves from companies that are profiting from Israeli settler colonialism. This is a nonviolent movement led by Palestinian civil society that Israel responds to with violence, right? Like criminalizing the leaders of the movement. Um, and then not just like, not just criminalizing the leaders of the movement, but of course, like enacting violence against them in, in occupied Palestine, but also attempting, right, through lawfare to ban BDS in the United States. And so even before October 2023, there have been a number of states in the country that have tried in various ways to ban BDS. We have lawsuits in Arizona and Texas and a couple of other places right. where people were told you have to sign a pledge that says you won't engage in BDS. Otherwise, you don't get business Otherwise, you don't get state. business here. You don't get the contract. You don't get right. the job. And so one of the things I always ask myself is what are they afraid of? Right? Like you don't try to stop a movement if it's not winning. Yeah. But the fact that they respond with such force. So the BDS movement has certain criteria that it applies um, to decide which companies to put on the list, right? And some of them include, um, some of them include like active, like profiteering from what is happening. Um, I believe there is also a 
you know, a search for like intersectional companies. So like companies that are harming different types of groups in different places, like or, or even having sites on or even having sites land, in right. unoccupied land. Um, and so there's like a number of different criteria and we follow the lead of the BDS movement. And so that list that you're looking at is the most vetted list. And the way the BDS movement distinguishes between those companies that include SodaStream and um, Hewlett Packard, I Hewlett Packard, uh, Puma, yeah. and a few others, is that that is what they are calling a targeted consumer boycott. I.e., we are asking everybody at once to drop these companies. What you have at the same time is a non-targeted consumer boycott of a much larger scale, and that's where you're going to get Nike. You're going to get um, Starbucks, Nike, Starbucks, McDonald's, McDonald's Fora, Coke, right. Pepsi, yeah. Sephora, Baskin Robbins. Baskin Robbins. <laughs> I know. Stop. What, what? Yeah, Baskin Robbins. I know. Like the. I, I feel so s- silly complaining about Baskin Robbins being on the list, but I'm so sad. I miss my ice cream. Anyhow, yeah. for those who don't know, Zara you, is a lover of of. You miss of your ice chocolate cream. swirl. My world class chocolate. World-class yes, chocolate. Chocolate. I miss there my world class yeah, chocolate. But yeah. that's okay. I eat Ben and Jerry's that's instead right. because they are amazing and are you know fighting Unilever so that they don't have to sell ice cream in the occupied territories. The so not. So there's a big, big list, right? There's targeted consumer boycott mm-hmm. and then there's broader boycott. And what is happening in this moment is that people are asking the question of where do I want to spend my money? When I visited um, Palestine in 2019, I remember like coming to this realization of sorts that every time I pay my taxes – I do so because I, I don't want to go to jail. Like, yes, mm-hmm. I believe the roads should be paved and schools should be funded. Mm-hmm. But ultimately, I pay my taxes because I don't want to go to jail. It's not like I can sit here and withhold some percentage mm-hmm. saying, well, That's I don't right. want it to it's go to Israel. It's definitely the stick right? more than the and carrot. So yeah. I am cho- but I am choosing my safety mm-hmm. and my health over the safety and health of Palestinians, right? right? So you go to like a Palestinian refugee camp. Like everybody's got someone that's been killed, someone that's been injured, someone that's lost a limb, someone that's su- suffering from PTSD. Why? Because I'm choosing my safety. And I don't have anywhere else to go as someone who was born and raised in this country and as someone who doesn't want to go to jail. So I can't, I I don't feel confident enough to be a tax protester or a tax resistor as, as, they're, as they're called. But I can make choices about where I spend my discretionary money, right? Like which company I buy my ice cream from, which clothes I purchase, which makeup stores I go to, which artists and mm-hmm. um, creators and influencers I support, right? Because that's another movement that's happened online in the last several weeks. I was going to ask about that, the, 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 the uh, hashtag blackout, right? That so is an interesting topic it for is. sure. Because what is the demand there? So like, for example, it, it's not in, like if, if a celebrity has not said anything in protest, that is enough to get them on the list. And at the same time, Someone like Jerry Seinfeld, who again, you're talking to two people who love the <laughs> don't show. Admit that anymore. Yeah, don't Seinfeld. Admit that anymore. I'm sorry, I'm going to just put it on the record. I hated uh, uh, Frosted, if that matters. Um, <laughs> right? I mean, I can only take so much of Jerry Seinfeld, yeah. but then you couple that with like Amy Schumer, and I'm out. Oh, um, right? So make that distinction though for me. So I'm having my boomer moment. Here. And my, yeah. under- my yeah. understanding, and you can confirm, is that it's a it's an a, it's a it's putting people on the spot who have a vo- a very amplified voice, right. and they should they they have a responsibility because right. of that influence. So to you're have their shaming influ- them to say something, essentially. Yeah. Okay. Well, well you, l- let me come back to sure. the, to the companies really quickly. Sure, I, sure, this sure, is please. like a, yeah, for yeah. for me, what's really important personally. Mm-hmm. in how I am choosing to live my life is yeah, I believe that's great that every dollar I have, I will answer for. Every single one, right? Like my mom used to tell us that when, when we were younger, she'd be like, you know, sometimes like like everybody wants to be rich, but being rich is in is a test. How did I spend it? Did I give it to Nike? Did I give it to Puma? Did I give it to Pepsi? Did I give it to Coca-Cola? And I don't claim perfection here. But we spend a lot of energy when we're talking about BDS asking about the bottom line of the company. And ultimately, like the bottom line of the company is like up to Allah. What I control is how I'm spending my dollars. Like I work so hard, right? And, you know, people know I work at care because I'm like a purist about my halal income. Mm-hmm. I'm going to take that halal income and go like buy food that somebody like contributes to genocide for, sure. right? Um, I remember when I was grappling with the question of chocolate, which is so hard, right? And this isn't just about Israel and Palestine or occupied Palestine. It's also about like slave labor in Africa. It's right. about labor practices in the United States. Is 
you'd be like, oh, wow, you know, like and organic. And by extension, coffee. Coffee, right? right like right. all of that, right? Mm. Like so organic, fair trade, like all of that is so much more expensive. But I eat chocolate for comfort and joy. Can I really take comfort and joy in something that like somebody else suffered for? I I am by no means perfect here. The way I think about it is I've got to keep trying, right? Okay. And so in the same way that like, you know, you work on your prayer and then you get better at your prayer. You work on your boycott and you get better at your boycott. I remember when I dropped Walmart more than a decade ago, it was like, oh, that felt really hard. Mm-hmm. And then and then Nestle was on my radar and I was like, okay, so, so to drop Nestle, you have to drop Arrowhead water. You've got to drop Dryer's ice cream. You've got to drop Carnation milk, right? And it was like, yeah, that, that takes time. And then once in a while, like somebody puts Dryer's strawberry mm-hmm. ice cream in front of you and it's just not not your best day. Right. But we're working on it, right? And so that's a, a point I always want to lift up for people around boycott, divestment, sanctions is like, yes, like, alhamdulillah, Starbucks is suffering right now. Alhamdulillah, McDonald's is suffering right now. But even if they weren't. What is my culpability as an individual right. consumer? Now, celebrities. Oh, oh sorry, well, real well, quick. Yes. Yeah, real quick on the list. I still don't even know what the list is. That's my issue. I, I, I'm a very, like, I need to see it myself. Right. And so I can go to BDS and see website the top and I see yes. the list. And I'm like, okay, those are out. But then I don't want to say, like, jump just because I heard somebody say something about some company. Fair. Like, is there, is there an official list? There... That we should should tell our kids, like, tell our families, literally not spend I I remember I went to Sephora at one point last October, November. I just needed some stuff. And I, like, showed the lady the list, uh, the lady who was working there, the list of, like, oh, what companies I can buy from, what companies I can't. So, she helped me pick out a few products, right? Mm. And then I went home and I told somebody, like, I forget who I was talking to. And they're like, wait, but you went to Sephora? You weren't supposed to go to Sephora. (laughs) And so, it's – Right. I don't – I have not seen one single list that has every company. For me, what's important is – looking to Palestinian leaders and organizations. And if they say, hey, we don't go to this company, then you know, like that that's usually sufficient for me. Um, I also just want to lift up the point that it, for us to be truly consistent, um, we also need want to be asking this question about other like other issues as mm-hmm. well. Right? Yeah, so yeah. like I stopped going to Chevron years ago because of the way they're contributing to pollution in Richmond, California, mm-hmm. and like so many other various allegations against Chevron. Like, the Nestle issue wasn't Palestine for me. It was how I feel like they were there was something about how they were pushing out formula um and discouraging um nursing in in various places across the world or they were buying up land and then like taking control of the water to then sell it so see the added problem like in addition to i think some of the things that omar highlighted as a consumer the problem that i have or the difficulty that i have in addition to just being able to identify who the culprits are is and 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 this is almost i have two purposes in, in stating this one is just to say that um it is complicated and number two to state that we, we're not oblivious, and I, by we, I mean the show, is we're not oblivious to conversations that are happening on Muslim Twitter, for example, mm-hmm. or on Muslim shows, social media, wherein you have scholars, right, who go on, the, who, who are on, who are very active on social media, promoting this idea that, uh, and, and there is definitely a, like a Venn diagram where you see the overlap, mm-hmm. which is that, okay, these protests don't do anything. They, they don't accomplish anything. Number two, uh, Allah is not, God Almighty is not going to ask you for how you spent your dollar. Or sorry. How, how your tuition was spent. Thank you. How your tuition was spent or where your tax, tax dollars went. Mm. Right? If we're talking about the same mm. <laughs> tweet. Uh, number three, though, and this is what I meant by Venn diagram, essentially a very quietist version of Islam that also says, Prote- uh, that 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 security mm-hmm. is better than anarchy. Mm-hmm. So that means that you, we are okay with regimes that have deeply problematic uh, human, uh, rights human rights records, abysmal. Yet that's better than open rebellion. So many layers to that question. Right. There's a lot. Um, so the and I state that one to state yeah. that it is complicated. But is it? Okay. Right, like it's it just it, so it's. I know you're not doing this. I, no, this isn't what you're doing. But like the so pro-Israel groups will often call it complicated, and it's like a way to shut down sure. debate and advocacy. Sure. Like, oh, you, you don't you don't get involved in Israel Palestine. It, it's complicated. Sure, it's like, sure. Okay, but no, no, no I, I know aside. you weren't doing this. Right, right. But, but like some some people, right? Some quietists, why do you say it's not complicated? Because uh-huh. right, 
I'm not out here saying that I am going to change the world with a protest. I know that the outcome is ultimately in Allah's hands. It's also simply false to say that protest doesn't work. Right. Our country was founded by protesters. And Allah's not going to ask me where my tuition dollars went or where my tax dollars went. Okay. Allah will ask me what I did with my voice that was given to me. Allah will ask me what I did with my limbs. Like I want, and Allah is merciful and generous. So let's say Allah is not like, why didn't you go to a protest with your legs? You know what? I want my legs to testify that I went to the protest. And I want my arms to testify that I held that banner. And I want the ground to testify that she stood here and she advocated for human rights with everything that she had. Mm -hmm. I don't come at this from a position of, Necessarily, Allah is going to punish me because I didn't do enough. I come at this from a position of I am commanded to right. do what is good and forbid what is wrong. And so why am I not doing that with everything that I have? And what you're not doing, or I should say this side isn't doing, is like f those who are, again, you know, given the pejorative, woke are doing, uh, is that we're not, we're not saying that God has commanded us to protest. And that everyone who doesn't is somehow a sinner because they're not. Right. Would Protest is not for that? everyone. Yes, that, okay. that's fair. I, I will say that God has commanded us sure. to take action for good. To enjoin good right? and forbid, and forbid evil. evil. Right. But and I am hands, not of the position that, we know yeah, that, and right. I'm not of the position that everybody has the same role to play. That's so I was at an encampment today and incredible. the advice to everybody at the encampment was mask up. Because the risk of being doxxed and your face ending up somewhere you don't want it to end up is very high in this moment where pro-Israel agitators are taking pictures of people and like putting their personal lives on the internet. I did not mask because the first time I was doxxed was like in 2006. So my internet, my face is everywhere. People yeah. know who I am. My role, right, is to be out there and at times be unmasked and be out front. That might not be someone else's role. Right. And it doesn't mean that you know what, actually, my favorite example of this is, um, so when the Muslim ban was first enacted by then President Trump uh, in his first term, um, there was a, like, collective of families who made a commitment to feed the care staff every day. Like, mm. they had a meal train set up for the care office. Right. Because they were like, we know you're all working around the clock and – you know, most people know I don't cook <laughs> effectively and the team doesn't have time to cook. And so they, they were bringing food to, to the office on a regular basis. Like we didn't go hungry that whole month. It was like three course meals and dessert showing up. <laughs> and so it's like your job was not to litigate the Muslim ban case. It was not to be at the airport protest. It was to feed the people who were. And we're seeing that right now actually with these encampments at college campuses is there are families who can't stay at the encampment when the riot police show up. but they drop off food every morning right. and there's like a lunch meal train and a dinner meal train. And so, no, I don't think, I don't believe that God is going to hold any individual to account for not going to a protest. I wouldn't advise an undocumented person or a person with severe physical disabilities to go to a protest and risk arrest the way I can. Uh, and that doesn't mean that they're any less than it means that their role is different and they might right. be contributing in some other way. Now the celebrities. The celebrities. Right. Okay. So the movement is to – okay. So I saw a sign at one of the encampments recently. I was like, it's 2024 and you're still Zionist? Like what's wrong with you? Read a book. It's 2024. We are so many days into this genocide that – like I, I remember when it was like one week, two weeks, a month – 500 people killed, a 1,000, really over 40,000, and that's a conservative estimate because have you noticed that number hasn't moved in weeks? It's because they're killing the journalists that's and so they're bombing true. the hospitals. So yeah. what is it really? And so if you still haven't said something, calling for an immediate and permanent ceasefire, what are you doing? Like what is your reason to not speak out? And some people may say, well, it's not really my lane and it's not my area of expertise and the – advocacy is that this moment does not require experts. It's not complicated. Israel is killing tens of thousands of Palestinians, men, women, and children of all ages. It has debilitated tens of thousands of children. It has wiped out entire bloodlines. It has left children with, what, what is the phrase, um, wounded child, no surviving family. It doesn't require expertise. This is everybody's lane right now. And if you are not speaking out on it, but you are an influencer, i.e. you are paid 
for your views and subscriptions and clicks and content, then people are saying, I no longer want to be a part of your money making machine. So it is to say, hey, like you can't make money off of my eyes and ears Mm -hmm. as you remain silent. And, you know, to to go to the thing about like what, where I, I'm appreciative of this, of this as a Muslim, right? So when it comes to boycott, divestment, sanctions, I'm asking myself as a Muslim, like, what do I do with my income, right? Like, how do I ensure that everything I, like, everything I earn is halal and everything that I eat is halal? So what kind of celebrity culture am I consuming that is devoid of any connection to the humanitarian crisis on the ground? Ultimately, if this leads to us becoming less enthralled with celebrities, less willing to blindly consume the trash they they cycle out in some <laughs> cases, um, then I'm all for it. And, you know, maybe somebody loses a couple of million followers. Maybe somebody only loses five, but I am not going to contribute to their clickbait content. Did it work? Like, there were, this started just a few weeks ago. Did, I, I, did folks start blocking celebrities? Mm-hmm. Has that subsided or did it it result in any uh, statements statements or uh, did they get any results? I have seen some statements that have emerged from this. I have seen more content from influencers that has been pro-Palestine. But ultimately, I would suggest that this is a turning point. This moment in time is one we will look back at Mm. five years from now, 10 years from now, 50 years from now to say who was on the right side who stood with humanity, and who was silent, complicit, and or advocating for genocide. And so, even if we're not getting a lot of movement in a specific instance, I think what we're we're creating a historical record. Mm -hmm. And we are course correcting as content consumers. So that, you know, we joked about like Jerry Seinfeld. Like, yeah, people consumed his content for years. And he's out here at like IDF training camps, like shooting at like, you know, Palestinian targets. And so he should get booed at graduation. And we will remember that. And the next time Seinfeld plays on reruns, like we're going to feel, we're going to think twice about whether or not we watch. Um, And we'll always know, right? Like he will be remembered as somebody who wasn't just silent on genocide in the case of so many of these influencers, but in fact, like supportive of. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so I, I think we covered. I think we covered a lot, th- pretty thoroughly about what's going and again, on. This is like, but mm-hmm. I know we talked about the abandoned Biden campaign. Like, mm-hmm. like we we, t- we touched on it. Is there any? Is there anything that more that needs to be stated there? Because, like again, this is something I still struggle with. Like, which is it, it reminds me of something AOC said. I think when she was being interviewed by Matthew Hassan, which mm-hmm. to me was sort of one of the most tempered answers to this mm-hmm. dilemma of why she continues to support Biden, aside from the fact mm-hmm, that she's mm-hmm. a Democrat and she, you know, yeah. what she has to say on the record, <laughs> was that at least with Biden, right, that she felt that she would have an ear, uh, right, of someone who's willing to consider the other side, willing to course correct, and maybe yeah. not even on the issue of Israel alone, right, right, right. in general. Whereas with Trump, it's just... Like it's 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 a bull in a china shop. It's just complete chaos. It's someone who doesn't really have an ideology, but is just whatever happens to strike his fancy, whatever whoever strokes his ego, whoever says the right things to him. So there, it's important to distinguish between the abandoned Biden groups uh-huh. and then the uncommitted groups. Uncommitted, right? and that's a great idea. And like, so abandoned like what Biden. Happened in, in, was what in Michigan? Michigan and Maryland, Maryland and right. so many other places. Right. And so abandoned Biden um, advocates are saying under no circumstances will they vote for Biden. There is nothing he can do to course correct at this stage. He needs to be punished for his actions. Regardless of the fact that if Trump was in office, he would have done the same thing. Correct. Because he hasn't done the same thing. Right. So he might. He will. He will. But he hasn't yet. And so what they're saying is you punish the person who is guilty of the genocide. Right. And that's different from the uncommitted camp, which is saying Biden has to earn our vote. And he has not done that yet. So we are not willing to pledge delegates to him at the convention. Hmm. It's a wait and see. In fact, the uncommitted groups 
have, in some ways, a different kind of leverage. Abandon Biden says we're not voting for you no matter what. Uncommitted says you can still potentially get our vote because we see that there is some prospect of change. And that prospect of change may be better than a Trump outcome. And so there's abandoned Biden. Okay. Then there's uncommitted. Right. Right. Then you've got your Trump loyalists. You've got your Biden loyalists. You've got people who are excited about Cornell West, which, by the way, you can't just vote for him in California. You have to register right. with that party. And then he has to get placed on the ballot, um, the Justice and Freedom Party. And then he has to get placed on the ballot, right? And so then there's yeah. like, and I've always joked that like, so now this is me, and that's just me like being informational on, you know, wearing the care hat, now taking off the care hat. Yeah. Personally, I've always joked that it's such a privilege to vote in California because mm. I've never had to choose between the lesser of two evils. I vote for who I want to vote for mm. because California is going solid blue no matter what. It's the least risky place to vote third party. And so for everybody that complains about, well, the two party system is terrible, what are you afraid of in California? It's going blue regardless. If I were in Michigan, I would be yeah. nervous about yeah. voting third party. And I, I don't know how I would do it. I always think like, you know, Allah is so generous. He's yeah. never, I can pontificate about all of this and I've never been tested with the actual dilemma because in California, my vote is so inconsequential. Right. And so I always come back to, and this is both personally and organizationally, I always come back to elections and voting are the bare minimum on civic engagement. So most people will vote every four years. They don't vote in the primary and they don't vote in the midterm and they don't think about it the day after election day or sometimes it takes two or three weeks to certify an election. But it's like, what are you doing to hold your elected officials accountable throughout the course of the cycle? And then how much attention are you paying to the down ballot races, right? Are you looking at people's records? Are you looking at who's endorsed them? Are you asking yourself, like, what are the consequential positions? And so I talked about district attorneys earlier School boards is another one. So we talked a bit about parental concerns for how schools and school administrators and teachers were navigating the question of LGBTQ diversity, right. curriculum, content, et cetera. Right. Guess who makes those decisions, right? No matter where you fall on the specific issue, the decision makers in your local school are the school board members. And most people don't realize, don't know who their school board members are. And by the way, like... That is one of the easiest ways to get your foot in the door on political office, right? And so run for school board, but we're just like president, president, president. It's like, you know, who affects your daily life? The district attorney, yeah. the school board member, the city council member. And so I don't know what this upcoming presidential election will bring us, but I am hopeful that people will understand that as much as protest and boycott and celebrity blocking and our watermelon t-shirts and everything that we're doing for Palestine is an important part of the effort, so too are our elections. Wow. Thank you so much for this entire conversation. We've covered so much ground, more than I imagined. And we've obviously taken way more of your time than I had intended. So thank you for your generosity. Thank you for your candor, as always. And last but not least, where you know, where can people engage you? Where can people obviously learn about the work that you're doing, that CARE is doing? Any kind of plug that you want to make, please. This is this is your opportunity support to do so. Support CARE. Yes. yes. <laughs> no, like, um, anything, more than engage, whatever support. You like. <laughs> So yeah. this care has been documenting complaints of anti-Muslim incidents, uh, hate ah, crimes to employment right. discrimination for 30 years. Right. And 2023 was our worst year ever. We saw an exponential increase locally and nationally. Hate crimes, hate incidents, employment discrimination, school bullying, and mm. law enforcement targeting. How much of that was that last quarter of 2023, that, meaning like post-October? The increase oh. was post-October, right? Uh, and so this period, post-October 2023, is – so 2023 in total, right, influenced by October 2023 and onward, was worse asking. than anything we have seen. Got it. And we've been responding uh, around the clock to ensure that our people are protected, but also that they know how to, like, 
speak up, that they are do- – and they're, so many of them are doing that for themselves. They don't need us to, like, help them plan a rally. What we get called for is the police are at the rally or do I need a permit for the rally or the FBI showed up at my door or my child was told that they can't wear a watermelon T-shirt to school or I was fired from my job for my Facebook post. And the list goes on. Like, the, the number of examples yeah. I could give you would be a whole other s- episode on its own. Easy. This – we are able to do this work – free of charge for all of our clients because the community supports care. And so if you have ever thought if something happens, I will call care or you know someone who's benefited care, I would urge you not just to make a one-time donation to the organization, but in fact to sign up to become a monthly donor because that's what enables people like me, your local friendly executive director, civil rights attorney, to be on call when people need help, to go to the encampment at night, to report to like – NBC and ABC in the middle of the day is those sustained monthly donations. And I don't just urge that for care. I urge that for every organization that you are appreciative of seeing on the front lines in this moment, whether it's $10 a month or $500 a month, whatever you can give, gives these organizations, right, care and everyone else that's doing this work stability so they can focus on the work rather than the like, how are we going to make payroll next month? You can look up your local care office by visiting care.com. You can find all of our offices across the country by doing that. And you can find me on Instagram, WhatsApp, Signal, X, Facebook, and probably a bunch of other platforms in between. You didn't say TikTok. I did. I have a TikTok account. I do, in fact. So long as it is legal in the U.S., I do have one. Well, again, uh, like I said, uh, thank you so much, Zahra, for your time and your generosity, um, both uh, just in your time and what you've shared and your insight is always so meaningful. Um, I, I should say uh, on the record, because I know they're going to listen to this, my wife and my daughters are your biggest fans. Um, so so they are eagerly waiting this episode. So <laughs> shout out to my wife and kids. Uh, and thank you again so much. Listeners, as always, if you have questions, comments, please uh, email us at diffusecongruence at gmail.com. Um, hit us up on Facebook, on Twitter, uh, TikTok, uh, wherever you consume and, and uh, wherever you find content. So thank you as always for listening and you will catch us on the next episode of Diffuse Congruence. Thank <laughs> you.